Ladies and gentlemen, I am very proud to introduce to you Mr. Vinton Gray Surf, who really and truly is the inventor of the internet. Thank you. Uh, he and a friend called Bob Kern, back in 1973, invented the TCP IP, which is the backbone of the internet to this day. He also did a lot of other things to bring about the internet to everybody on the planet. And his official title, he is vice president at Google, but he's also the chief internet evangelist, which means that he is committed to bring more and more people onto the internet. Uh, don't be mistaken by his modesty, because his achievement is really unmatched. And so, perhaps we will travel back in time uh, to start this discussion and this dialogue, which will take us exactly 30 minutes, during which time you hopefully will be drinking, but not necessarily being served dinner. So serving dinner, you'll have to wait till we get our dinner as well. So uh, Vin Cerf and his lovely wife Sigrid are, I'm proud to say, good friends and uh, with whom we, we have uh, explored many things together. And even under his wing, he and I, uh, a few years ago, looked at the issue of internet governance. So, Vint, let us start from uh, that time, back in 1973, when uh, there was still called the ARPANET, and there was not yet the internet, and there was a need to unify and create a new system that would link various things together. So let's see whether I can answer Ismail's question. Uh, in order to get more quiet in the room, I can make a simple threat. If people are not quiet, I'm going to turn off all of your email. Uh, on, on the other hand, you may want me to do that because you're sick and tired of email. So Ismail, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, Bob Kahn and I began working on the design of what you call the Internet. It was a Defense Department project designed to bring computers to command and control. But the irony and the benefit that everyone in this room has received is that the work was done by academics like me. I was at Stanford University, my colleagues were at uh, SRI International, at MIT, at Carnegie Mellon, at UCLA. So we brought a very academic perspective to the development of the network. In particular, we believed in information sharing. And so at the heart of the internet design is openness, the willingness to accept new ideas, the uh, availability of new technology to enhance and spread the system. So we designed the network to grow, and indeed it has by a factor of more than a million since it was first turned on in 1983. Wow. And it's one of the very, very few designs ever made that could be scaled up a million fold and still continue to be robust and reliable. And that uh, brings me to mention something that in the end, uh, although it took a little bit longer uh, when it got started, in the history of the world, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this statistic. In the history of the world, there has never been a transformation as total and as rapid as that. As of 1993, only 1% of the information that traveled around the world was on the internet. By the year 2000, seven years later, it was 51% of total information. 
And by 2007, it was 97% of all information on the planet is moving on your backbone. Even I didn't know that statistic, but it tells you something interesting about the year 2007. Those of you who are carrying smartphones in your pockets should realize that they've only been around for 11 years. Look how quickly we have become you know, essentially addicted to our mobiles. There's a reason for that. The mobile made the internet more accessible and the internet made the mobile more useful because it had access to all of the World Wide Web's content. And so you can see why there would be such a rapid uh, assimilation of this technology because getting access to the world's information at your fingertips whenever you need it uh, is ultimately beguiling and it also is ultimately very satisfying. But when you were determined, you and your colleagues who invented the internet, to keep it open to everybody and uh, to make sure that uh, it was pretty much a public good. And yet, we have seen uh, the continued expansion of access to the internet accompanied by some various risks and rewards, if one can use them such. There are uh, uh, risks of misinformation, disinformation, uh, risks that affect human behavior, such as social media, and there are technical risks uh, from malware, identity theft, and so on. Would you care to comment about the dual nature of the Internet? Well, when the Internet was first developed, uh, my expectation was that we would lower the barrier for people to put information into the network and to get information back out of it. We thought that was an important path towards making the world's information accessible and universally useful. By lowering the barrier to almost zero, uh, we didn't take into account uh, the fact that human beings are not all uniformly kind to each other. Uh, those of you who read Shakespeare's plays know that we still read them 400 years after he wrote them, and there's a reason for that. Humans haven't changed in those 400 years. And some of us are not motivated by other people's best interests. So those of you who attended the last session will know that we talked about environment and environmental pollution. And I think what we are, those are people who deliberately pollute the atmosphere and the water uh, and the land for their own purposes and their own reasons. Think for just a moment about what we're experiencing in today's internet. We're seeing a kind of information pollution. People are injecting misinformation, either deliberately or out of ignorance, and it propagates with the speed of light across the network, sometimes through social media, which have their own beguiling properties. They create echo chambers, they create places where uh, what's called uh, confirmation bias drives people into believing things that are not necessarily true, but they believe them because they're comfortable believing them. And so, Ismail, the problem we have now is that we have content on the internet which is not always correct. It's not always believable. The price we are going to have to pay for access to all that information is to start using our heads to think critically about what we're seeing and hearing. This is work. It's going to take work to decide what information to accept and what information to reject. No matter what companies like Google and Facebook and, and Amazon and, uh, and others do, the ultimate filter is the wetware in our heads. And so we are going to have to commit ourselves to working and teaching our kids to work to decide what information to accept and what information to reject. A critical mind is what is needed, definitely. You're absolutely right. But let me ask a very nasty question, if I may. What about the so-called dark web? What about the, the, uh, all the illegal transactions uh, that occur on the web where people can hide uh, from uh, their being responsible for their actions? Well, so this is another example of what happens when you invent technology for one purpose and somebody uses it for something else. Cryptography 
is a very important tool for protecting people's privacy and their confidentiality. Businesses use it, governments use it for very good reasons. The problem is that that technology is now available to any person on the planet and it's used to hide activities that we would otherwise consider to be either illegal or harmful. So the dark web is a place where that cryptographic technology is used to hide activity that many of us think is uh, inappropriate. Uh, we have, we've had to deal with this in the past, Ismail. There have been activities that are illegal and inappropriate, uh, I think, ever since human beings have been on the planet. But now there's just a, yet another tool for people to um, carry out their activities uh, in a way that's hidden. I have to tell you, though, I will bet you that no one in this room would want to live at either ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is one where everything is so secret and so private that you never know when anyone is planning to do something harmful. That feels like a very unsafe society to live in. On the other hand, suppose you lived in a society where everything was open, everyone knew what everyone else was doing. Uh, that doesn't feel like the best place to live either. There are things that people would like to keep private. If any of you have ever lived in a small village of a few thousand people, you know that there aren't very many secrets because everybody knows what everybody is doing. I know because I lived in a little village in Germany in 1962. And the postmaster knew more than anyone else in the village because he was the one that placed the phone calls and he was the one that distributed the mail. So he knew who was writing to whom, who was calling to whom. Everybody knew what was going on. So we have to find a place in between where we protect people's privacy and confidentiality, but we don't allow criminal behavior to be completely unexposed. Well, okay, on that, on that note, I may turn to the question of a social conundrum that is a result of the internet. Basically, um, you know, it enables us to stay in touch with friends around the world, uh, certainly through emails, blogs, web pages, social media. Uh, but at the same time, many young people are somewhat isolated from their local contacts, uh, mostly texting to each other rather than interacting uh, physically. There, there's a book that those of you who haven't uh, seen it would might find useful to read. It's called Alone Together. Uh, it's by um, a professor at MIT whose name just flew out of my head. I'd have to go Google it uh, to remember. But you know, what, is, what is her name? Do you remember? Uh, Turkle, Sherry Turkle at MIT. She's written several books, but Alone Together is a very interesting book. She talks about young people who are sitting in gatherings like this one, sitting around the table or perhaps just a, you know, in, a, in, in the living room somewhere. They all have their mobiles out and they're talking to people who are not in the room. She points out a very interesting side effect of this behavior. First one is that when you're texting or emailing, you're forgiven if you don't respond right away because you might have been distracted or you had something else to do. Do you notice what that means? It means that you don't have to respond to a question or a statement that made you uncomfortable. Now imagine instead that it's a conversation that Ismail and I are having right in front of you. If he asks me a question that I'm uncomfortable with, and I say nothing, the silence will be quite obvious to you and to Ismail and to me. It's very uncomfortable. The kids like the idea that they are not confronted with that moment of silence. They don't talk to each other on the phone because there's that risk. And so what Sherry is saying is that we're using technology to hide. And it's, this is not a good, sociologically not a good thing. So here we are, we have these wonderful technologies. I use email constantly to stay in touch with my family because I travel 80% of my time. And so I think of the, these tools as a wonderful way to stay connected with a very large collection of people. But on the other hand, you could use the same technology to isolate yourself. How many times have you whipped up your phone and walked out of the room as if you were making a phone call there wasn't any phone call. You just wanted to get out of that conversation. 
So here we are, sort of abusing the technology that we've invented. Well, I also want to call you uh, to comment on two things that are happening. One of them is the fact that there's an enormous explosion of information. Uh, the uh, big data phenomenon, or more importantly, that uh, on the internet we are putting uh, several exabytes a day. Uh, just for those of you in the audience who don't know what an exabyte is, aside from being a billion, billion bytes, it's if you were to digitize all the text in the Library of Congress, one exabyte would be more than a hundred thousand times more than all the text in the Library of Congress. And we are putting, as of now, more than two exabytes every day on the internet. So this explosion of information will require more and more machines to read, organize, and handle them. And uh, will we lose sight of uh, what that information is all about? So, you know, people look at all this content on the internet and sometimes you'll say, I don't need to see most of the cat videos and all the other things that are part of the exabytes that show up. By good fortune, we have computers to help us. They augment our wetware. And so, for example, Google has a fleet of computers that crawl through the World Wide Web and index it in order to help you find things and avoid wasting your time looking at things you're not interested in. So we're getting some help from the same machines that are helping us produce all of this content. So that's a good thing. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are tools that can be used to augment our ability to find things that are of interest or even discover things that we didn't notice. Two people in the audience that I want to uh, embarrass by drawing attention to them. One of them is Brewster Kale over there. Brewster, raise your hand. Brewster, Brewster is the guy who said, way 25 years ago, maybe we should save the World Wide Web. Maybe we should capture it because it disappears. Information in the web goes away. In fact, it has this peculiar property. It remembers things that we wish it would forget, and it forgets things that we wish it would remember. And so Brewster's business at the Internet Archive is to try to collect as much of it as he can manage to store away. This turns out to be very important because bits do no, are not immortal. Bits go away. Sometimes the medium is not readable anymore. Sometimes the format of the information is not interpretable, and so you need software that doesn't run anymore in order to look at the pictures that were taken. There are all kinds of problems associated with digital preservation, so I want to just a shout out to Brewster for what he's trying to do. The other guy is Froda Hegland, who's over here at this table. Froda, wave your hand. Froda is a disciple of Douglas Engelbart. Engelbart, back in the 1960s, invented the mouse so he could point to things on the screen and say, please link from this document to that document. That's what you do every day with today's World Wide Web. But Engelbart had in his head and created a system that did that in the 1960s. He built the World Wide Web in a box for all practical purposes. Why do, I draw, why do I draw your attention to Froda other than to embarrass him? It's because Froda realizes that once computers get access to text, it expands our ability to interact with it in ways that we could not before. It's almost as if there was a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth dimension to the text beyond the two-dimensional sheet of paper that we have historically looked at. And so this ability to use computer cycles to reach into a body of content and to extract meaning from it, to make associations with it, is an extraordinary change in the way we deal with information. And so I want to give Froda a shout out for his persistence in trying to pursue that space. Yes. And while I'm at it, by the way, I've had my wife said to me after we had a lovely meal with Ismail that she didn't need Google anymore because she had Ismail. <laughs> Uh, Sigrid is much too kind. Uh, uh, now, I must say something that most people will find surprising, and that is that you are uh, concerned about uh, the preservation of digital information. 
and uh, that you have a, a nightmarish vision uh, of a possible future where uh, digital information could become inaccessible. Some of you will remember a lot of information would have been lost were it not for monks in monasteries copying texts from one vellum manuscript to another. Here's what I worry about. The digital information that we create, the multiple exabytes that Ismail mentioned, gets stored away in places that don't necessarily have any guaranteed longevity. You might have examples of this already at home. I have five and a quarter inch floppy disks from the 1980s that I use with my little Apple II Plus machine. I don't have an Apple II Plus machine anymore and I don't have a disk reader to read those disks. I have three and a half inch floppy disks left over from early Macintosh days. I actually found a three and a half inch floppy disk reader, which I could plug into my Macintosh with a USB connector, and I read what was on the three and a half inch disk. And I discovered I had a bunch of WordPerfect files which don't run on the operating systems that I have available. So this just emphasized for me the fragility of information in digital form. It gets worse. The World Wide Web has the property that it uses URLs, uniform record locators, to steer you to information on the net. And you click on those URLs, and most of the time, a web page pops up. But some of the time, you get, sorry, 404, page not found. Why did that happen? Well, the domain name, like www.google.com, is buried in the URL, and it's used to steer you to a computer that's supposed to have the content on it. But if somebody forgot to pay the rent on the domain name, and the domain name expired, then it may no longer resolve to get you to the computer where the data used to be. Or worse, uh, somebody just went out of business and abandoned the domain name, or somebody purchased the domain name after it expired and put new information on that domain name, not the one that the URL pointed to. So we have a very fragile environment when it comes to referencing content online. I want you to think for a moment about the printed works that you read today that have footnotes in them with URLs. Imagine 50 years from now, someone is reading those documents, even if they're reading them in, in digital form, and they click on that hyperlink, and it doesn't go anywhere because the URL doesn't resolve. This is really scary, folks. It means that the basis for our arguments, the logic that we um, articulate in the papers we're writing, uh, may no longer be available, the, the logic may not be supported by the references because you can't find the references. For scientific information, this is a disaster. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure we preserve digital content long, longer than we can today, for hundreds of years if possible. Well, I, uh, I hope that we will continue and uh, Brewster's uh, Wayback Machine, among other things, will help us uh, search for some of those things as well. Let me ask you three uh, particular new uh, technologies that are impacting on everybody, and everybody's heard about them. Uh, one is the blockchain technology associated in most people's minds with Bitcoin, but not necessarily. It's a different technology of which Bitcoin is only an application uh, that blockchain, which is a, 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 a distributed ledger, if you, if you want to call it that, is uh, both transparent and at the same time not changeable, but uh, also is not uh, under anybody's authority. The second one is about quantum computing and whether or not we are going to have a significant transformation in how computing is being done. And the third one is a special program that you and I talked about before, about space, but I'll come to that at the end. Well, uh, people ask me about Bitcoin, and my reaction is, run the other way. 
this is a highly speculative kind of um, tulip craze uh, phenomenon. There is no intrinsic value in any of these uh, cryptographic currencies. There is no intrinsic value. It's all based on speculation. And so uh, if you like to speculate, fine, go ahead, but treat it as if it's a horse race somewhere and you made a bet and maybe you'll lose. Now, the blockchain is part of the Bitcoin system, but people are um, excited about the fact that you could distribute information in a way that is uh, unalterable without visible uh, with, without visibility. In other words, the blockchain is a way of digitally signing content in a way that um, if someone tried to change the record of a transaction or alter the you know, direction of money going from this bank account to another, it would be visible. The digital signature would fail. So the blocks are, chains of, are collections of transactions. Each block is chained to the previous block. Now you might say, that sounds pretty good, if multiple parties, like all of you, could be maintaining the digital ledger, even if somebody disappears, the computer goes away, we have multiple copies of the transactions in this digitally signed form. The problem I have with this is that you're relying on anonymous parties to maintain the information. Uh, not everyone, including me, is comfortable with that. Frankly, I would prefer what is called a permissioned blockchain where there are known parties resp taking responsibility for maintaining the information. But either way, let's suppose you're sold on the idea of this distributed ledger with the unalterable uh, transactions in it. Then you need to understand that the item of value that's referenced in the blockchain entry, the transaction, that item of value is not in the blockchain. It's somewhere else. So in the case of Bitcoin, for example, the transaction information that this Bitcoin went from here to here is in the blockchain. The Bitcoin itself is sitting in a digital wallet somewhere. The digital wallet's implementation may be weak when it comes to security. The result is that even if the transactions, uh, transaction record is preserved, the bitcoins may go away because somebody found a way to break into the wallet. It's just like breaking into the bank. And you've probably read headlines where places that held the bitcoins have lost hundreds of thousands of them worth enormous amounts of, uh, well, theoretically worth enormous amounts of money. So I am uh, a, I'm not a huge fan of blockchain. I acknowledge that it can be useful. But you have to think carefully about when it's useful. Just one other point about blockchain. There's a certain rate at which you can assemble and digitally sign the transactions. The blockchains of today do not reach the levels of transaction rates that we see even in just e-commerce. Billions of transactions a day. And so it's not clear that blockchain will do the job for everything that people imagine it can do. But for properly scaled situations where we want to keep a, um, a, a reliable record of events taking place, blockchain can be useful. But please be very thoughtful about, uh, about this. Don't let someone come and sell you a bottle full of blockchain snake oil. Okay. Okay. How about quantum computing? Quantum computing. It's real. It is possible to build a quantum computer, and I'm proud to say that Google is among the companies that are building quantum computers. We have uh, an aspiration this year to build a 49-qubit system. You might say, 49 sounds like an awfully small number. Who cares? The answer is that there are computations that we can do with a quantum computer with that many qubits that cannot be done by a conventional computer in any reasonable amount of time. And so if we are successful in implementing this particular machine, we will be able to demonstrate the feasibility of algorithms running faster than we could run them in any other uh, fashion. Now, I can tell you we've already discovered algorithms that are of use to us that will run on the quantum machine in a way that, uh, that is uh, beneficial. So that's an exciting new technology. It has one very scary aspect to it, Ismail. 
most of the cryptography that you rely on today to keep your transactions private use the uh, difficulty of factoring the products of large primes as the way to make it hard for somebody to break into the cryptographic system. It turns out that one of the things you can do with a quantum computer is to factor the products of large primes in very little time using something called Shor's algorithm. So we have this juggernaut of quantum computing coming which is going to make useless a lot of the uh, cryptographic methods that are in use today. Fortunately, there are some other mathematical uh, uh, items, uh, mainly lattice-based mathematics, that do not uh, have the same vulnerability to quantum computing. And so people who are worried about cryptography are already working on the post-quantum capability to protect your interests, your secrets, and your confidences. So it's real, it's important, and we may actually be able to do some things that would have been out of, uh, out of the question uh, for useful optimizations, for example. Well, okay, now there's, considering this particular audience, there is something, of course, that is uh, 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 very close to everybody's uh, concerns. And I think we would like to hear uh, a comment from you about free speech, uh, hate speech, free speech, censorship, uh, other means of dealing with uh, speech on the internet? So this is a really hard problem. Uh, first of all, some people hear hate speech and they don't think it's hate speech because they agree with it. And so we have this problem that uh, the, uh, the, the way in which some of these expressions are received varies depending on the population of people who are engaged in it. Uh, and to make matters more complicated, because of the uh, low threshold for injecting content into the net, there are millions, if not billions, of sources of content. Which means that if you want to listen to speech that you agree with, you can almost certainly find it. Uh, so people are not being confronted by uh, different views necessarily, because they can search for those views on the net that are you know, compatible with their opinions. So figuring out how to deal with this problem is a tough one. Uh, even if we all agreed that certain kinds of speech is unacceptable, then the question will be, well, how do we discover it and how do we try to remove it? And as soon as you try to do that, you get this question, who should decide what speech is unacceptable and how should that decision be made? And this, of course, edges into the censorship space. Once you begin to build mechanisms for shutting down speech that we all agree is not acceptable, who is to stop someone from saying, well, this political speech is also not acceptable? And now we're on a slippery slope. This is not an easy problem to deal with because we all recognize that there are things that are simply so repugnant that we wish that we could shut them out. Uh, some of you know that uh, in the United States there's a, an important First Amendment to our Constitution which speaks to the freedom of speech. And it's so important to us that we're willing to tolerate things that we don't agree with. Now, to make matters worse, some people will say, why don't you use artificial intelligence and machine learning to filter out the bad stuff? Surely you can do that. And the answer is not so clear, and here's why. Those algorithms often make use of statistical information. If everyone says, this is good speech, and this is bad speech, we might say, well, let's just add up the good speech and the bad speech numbers, and we'll reject the stuff that, that doesn't win. The problem we have is that our algorithms can't tell the difference between a botnet expressing itself, multiplying an, an opinion artificially by factors of a million or more from human beings expressing their opinion. So now we have the problem that someone who wants to um, create speech that you didn't want to hear can make it artificially appear to be the general view 
of some segment of the population by using a computer or a bunch of computers to repeat the same speech over and over again. How many times have you heard the, the observation, if you hear the same thing over and over and over again, eventually sometimes you begin to believe it. The big lie repeated frequently is accepted because you become accustomed to it. So Ismail, this is not going to be an easy problem to solve. We can't just have a show of hands because some of the hands are fake hands. You were worried about fake news. I'm worried about fake hands uh, in the, in the uh, computer robotic sense of the word. Indeed. So frankly, companies like mine and others are struggling to find ways to do two things. First, to try to filter things that are truly just inappropriate. And second, to try to draw people's attention to the counter arguments. And that we can try to do by directing people to both sides of an argument. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Vincent.